So our next session brings together some of the leading figures in UK fintech to ask what must be the question of the hour. What does the UK fintech market look like in the COVID era? To talk about that over the next 45 minutes, we're joined by the following. Helen Child, co-founder of Open Banking Excellence, which is the leading community of open banking and open finance members and founders. Martin Holman, a partner and investor fund All Benton Fintech with nearly 20 years of experience. Caroline Plum, she's the CEO and co-founder of a London fintech called Fluidly, which is a B2B finance and service business and helps company manage cash flow. And Anton, I hope I'm saying the surname right, Rudin Clow, uh, a partner at Financial Innovation. Um, he's a partner and a financial innovation chief at KPMG. Um, so welcome to all, all four of you. I think I can see Helen. Uh, we're missing, uh, there's Anton. And uh, there's Martin and Caroline. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so let's dive in. So if we go back a couple of months, um, I was basically talking to VCs and founders and anyone I could get a, a Zoom link to, to try and work out what was happening. Um, it was quite, it was very mixed at that time. Uh, but we've seen now, I guess the time is, is a beautiful thing in that we can actually see the impact that we're, that we're having because of COVID. Um, some of that impact includes down rounds, growth projects being suspended um, at the likes of Manis and, and Neobank, um, payment volumes are down, redundancies, etc. So it can paint quite a bleak picture. Um, but Martin from Augmentum, I want to come to you first. Is it as bad as it might seem from the outset, given those uh, particular factors? Yeah, you make it sound uh, pretty grim there. With, yeah, I, uh, some of those statistics. <laughs> I mean, I, I always paint a, a significantly more upbeat picture. So looking first on the, um, on the investment side, I mean, if you look at the numbers themselves, there's been relatively low interruption over this entire period so look, look some of the early data that was published by Crunchbase, the sort of january to april time notwithstanding that a lot of that period i guess was uh, prior to to lockdown global vc investment over that period was pretty much flat year on year it was i think it was 82 billion versus 92 billion the year before 93 billion in 2019 uh, and the factors there was largely driven by China, which was what into the lockdown, uh, that, that reduction, 30% 30, 30 down in China. So uh, driven by, you know, uh, earlier lockdowns there. And then impact um, really, um, uh, the rest of that impact really at the early seats, earlier stage. So seed and A rounds down 30% and flat year on year for the later stage. I'll come on to some of those drivers in a moment. And that uh, early evidence has kind of been reinforced by later uh, data that's been uh, since published uh, by Deal Room, uh, which looked at, uh, which basically says that European uh, fintech VC, VC investment uh, is, is flat uh, pretty much year on year um, at about 2.9 billion down in Q1 uh, and up in Q2, with the UK and France being broadly flat and Germany taking a bit of a dent as a result of fewer mega deals happening uh, in the 100 million plus uh, dollar range. Um, so what's the driver of that? Well, if you look at that sort of flight to later stage, I mean, most of, um, so most later stage uh, venture capital investments, they're already in a portfolio. They're already in a VC portfolio. There's been a generalized focus on portfolio during the early part of the lockdown, ensuring liquidity uh, and government incentives trigger a lot of those rounds. So those rounds were, were, were happening. And, and so the later stage companies were, were largely covered. And then all later stage companies were more likely to already be in a deal flow process because uh, time to funding generally takes a little bit longer at later stage. And uh, VCs who were entering into the lockdown had kind of a, a captive audience, if you like, that, that their, uh, their selections were, were limited by those that they had in front of them that they already knew, perhaps had already visited, perhaps already in rounds of due diligence. Mm. So um, fewer, the, the fewer, me fewer mega deals at that stage, but strength really sort of playing through. Um, so that's really on the investment side, sort of flat, but, you know, later stage, um, uh, particularly in the later stage. And then if I think about how that's reflected in our portfolio, I mean, there's been a pretty much a balanced, uh, a balanced experience. So there's lots of positive experience. You know, volatility of the period has increased uh, um, uh, 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 share, share trading, so the likes of interacting investor in our portfolio. Um, uh, another, por another our portfolio companies, Fairwell, digitizing death. Uh, it sounds pretty morbid, but actually 
uh, you know, it's driven driven activity there. Bullion vault, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of flight into into gold as safe custody, and uh, our portfolio investment in Grover in uh, in Berlin, which was offering subscription to home office equipment. I mean, the, the, there is there there are lots of positives that have flowed from this period, as well as the challenges on you know with, with exposure to SME uh, SME SME lending, and that's yeah. kind of, kind of reflected in that sort of balanced approach across the portfolio. So a mixed bag, essentially. Um, yeah. So you have a lot of B2C uh, fintechs in your portfolio, I know. Um, and Caroline, who's with us today, she is a founder, you are a founder in the B2B fintech space. Um, so I imagine that's had a slightly different impact. And perhaps you can just tell us a little bit about your experience on the ground and the conversation you've had to had, have with employees, investors, etc., uh, and clients, of course. Yes, I mean, we're in the kind of um, cash flow management for small and medium sized businesses and the kind of the SME sector is somewhere between kind of a uh, consumer and enterprise, I suppose, in, in behavior and, and style. Um, but I think what's interesting, I mean, uh, I think it's important to distinguish between trading performance and financing nervousness. So, you know, we're in the fortunate position that cash flow management uh, is a topic right now that's uh, very timely uh, and never been more so really. So actually, from our perspective, revenues are growing and our trading performance is pretty good. But the challenge is really the financing environment and do we believe that the, the deals that are out there and the deals that are being done um, are, are going to stay and then be at the valuations that people are looking for um, and how they pan out. So I think, you know, in, in terms of our response to the pandemic was, very much to give ourselves enough runway that if we need it um, we're not looking to take financing this year for example um, mm -hmm. so whereas well we would have probably planned a financing round this year so for us it's about giving ourselves time and space um, so that we're not under pressure and I think so therefore you're making a decision that um, based on financing versus trading performance if you see what I mean um, and just to kind of separate those those two out and I think the, the, the data that Martin had certainly showed, you know, activity being broadly flat. But again, I think a lot of that is pipelines. You know, these deals on average take at least three months, maybe even six, as, you know, in the larger sector segments. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what will be interesting is what actually happens with how many deals have done in, in the third quarter, um, because that will reflect the activity over the second quarter. And, and there I'd be surprised if that was as high, um, because I, I do think there has been that shift. And I, also what I see is that VCs are, you know, focusing on supporting you know, the subsection of their portfolio they find viable um, and so where you are seeing a lot of investment I think that is not necessarily new investors leading on new rounds always I think mm -hmm. some of that's happening but a lot of that is reinvestment um, into existing portfolio businesses by existing investors to provide them with the capital to kind of see through the trading period and perhaps other people joining in so I think the picture is um, and, and undoubtedly there's an impact um, you know, across the market. And as Martin alluded to, I think the SME financing and funding space in particular has been um, very interesting because effectively you've got the government coming in as a new provider of loans. And this new product is essentially um, a zero interest for 12 months and then low capped interest product um, across the board. So if you are a lender, if you have been a lender um, and you're trying to compete in that market, you effectively have a new competitor in the government who is going to is you know, going to wash out all products um, prior to that. So I think that has created a lot of um, interesting dynamics in that market at the moment and really where the values captured has really moved around a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're one of the, the, you must be the envy of some of your peers that you don't have to do a funding round at the moment. Um, I think I saw a stat that was 50% of UK fintechs don't have a runway uh, of over 18 months. So that leaves 50% you know, essentially very much thinking about fundraising. But that was, I mean, that was a deliberate policy from us. It was one yeah. of our first decisions in the pandemic to push out our runway to 2022. Um, because we we realised that we we don't want to be backed into a corner on it, but hopefully hopefully we were overly conservative. <laughs> <laughs> um, Helen um, from Open Banking Excellence, you're, I know you're close to not just founders uh, in your role, but also uh, banks. Um, what's been the mood among those that you, you've been speaking to, and what major changes do you think will come from COVID or have already come to the fintech market? Good morning, Isabel. Um, it's a great question, and and to just to to build on what everybody was was saying. Um, I know there's, there's a couple of founders that have actually completed Series A and Series A plus all during COVID and um, we will be, be sharing that news when, when we can. 
So I think they um, deserve a huge shout out when, when they want to go public. But I also know other founders um, that were, as, um, as Martin was saying, partway through their funding and the, 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 the rates were getting discounted, so have parked it. And, and, and that has obviously had uh, consequences throughout, throughout their business. But just to add a, another dynamic to the conversation, I've actually, um, Open Banking Excellence is this amazing community that now has a, a global reach. And we've got fintechs, big techs, banks, regulators. So a, a broad spectrum. And it is, it's a real privilege. First of all, I've found our place um, during the, 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 the pandemic where we sit within that ecosystem, keeping everybody connected and supporting everybody behind the scenes. And it is a privilege to do that. But I've also seen the very, very best of fintech, that day one mentality that we can uh, give us a problem and we can resolve it. And I think there's probably three points that I would like to, to talk to to that, um, just to, to sort of change the mood and to only we've got you know, the, the pandemic and then we've got Brexit looming. You know, so the, 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 the landscape um, is, is tough, it's challenging. But I think you, you do see the, the very, very best of fintech. And we saw that with our OBE heroes. And these were uh, chief execs and, and founders that galvanized their team very quickly at the beginning of the pandemic to resolve a, a, a problem. And just to give, a, a, and, and you saw some, some amazing responses. Um, and to just give a few of them a shout out, you've got Nigel that, that you know, Isabel, Nigel Verdon from, um, from Rails Bank. They, they had lightning aid, which distributes aid to the, the sick, the vulnerable, and those self-isolating. And they went from idea to app um, App Store, sorry, in, in eight days, just phenomenal. And then you had Francesca from um, TrueLayer who, who came on and said, you know, give a FinTech a problem and we'll resolve it. And that has to be encouraging. And he brought on Coconut and they, um, they create ways for the self-employed to get access to, to, um, to, to, to funding that otherwise they'd have missed out on. And then Caroline. So, yeah, just so in terms of what you're seeing, then it means that you're seeing fintechs, I guess, pivot or, or, or launch new products quicker than they might have done without COVID. That's kind of the trend. A a absolutely, absolutely. And, and to Caroline's point, you've got, you know, two more of our heroes, you know, Nick Ogden um, from Clearbank and, and Simon uh, Curtin from Funding Options. They, they were um, wanting to distribute the the Siebel's and, and, and the bounce back loans. And I think that's a story that will run where, uh, the, op, um, where the FinTech hasn't been utilized to the best of its, its ability. Mm -hmm. uh, the government, you know, have done an absolutely it's an amazing job. I don't think there's anybody in the country that would say otherwise, but they could have utilized um, the very best of FinTech differently. And I think that if you want to follow that story, that's one that, that will sort of break and, and, and continue. So yeah, I've seen that definitely yeah. been a disappointment i think for the for the fintech sector um for context that there were the distribution of uk loans and not all the fintechs particularly non uh, bank lenders have been able to distribute those um to helen's point so that's something yeah. that we'll be we'll be watching closely um helen i just want to stop you there so we can move on to anton because they're quite pressed um to anton from kpmg if you could tell us a little bit about what you do and uh, the advice that you've been given to those uh, around you in a downturn yeah, sure. Um, and thank you for having me. Uh, firstly, um, shout out to Caroline. I'm a big super fan of Fleur. She knows that. Um, they're an awesome firm and they're everything that FinTech should be. They're different. They use data. Um, they're smart and they, they don't have to be big. Um, but you know, we're at KPMG. We're business advisors. Um, so we've got the accountants with the clipboards at one end of the spectrum um, through to our deal advisors. And we do M&A and fundraising um, support for clients as well. Um, and in that respect, um, the, the community that's on here are representative of some of the relationships we have in the market. Um, if I just um, sort of pick up on a couple of things, um, I think um, our, our economy in the UK will be, a, will be in depression for the next three years. There's no, no way of getting around that. And, mm -hmm. and if we think otherwise, then I think we really are smoking something. That, yeah. but, but, but in that respect, um, it, it doesn't really matter for the fintech. Mm -hmm. um, because we're, we're dealing with entrepreneurs here who will find interesting ways of solving interesting problems. Um, the FCA have a statistic for the major banks in the UK, which is a preemptive for their new digital sandbox they're about to launch, which is that 94% of the processes within banks are not yet digitised, including, strangely enough, not um, credit and lending, which we've been discussing right now. So there's a huge opportunity, I think, to actually innovate and replace the legacy infrastructure that we have that is called financial services. 
Mm -hmm. um, and a big part of that is payments. Um, we focus a lot on the non-bank lenders. 70% of fintech is payments related. It's not non-bank lending. It's not the digital banks at all. Yeah. And actually payments has been going off during the crisis. So we talk around deals. We've had just under 500 deals announced for payments globally. Globally, yeah. Globally since March 1st. Mm. And a lot of that is non-traditional payments. It's not what we would call fintech, but it's e-commerce, it's content-related services, security, um, digital identity, hot topic. Again, going to be picked up by the government here shortly. Um, and so I think for uh, fintech um, founders and entrepreneurs, if you oscillate around the payment space, then it's game on. And I do think that's the acceleration to digital we talk about. And actually payments in some respects underpins lending as well, lending decisions. Mm. So for me, that is a great opportunity for fintech founders that are coming into the UK market and does kind of go with this notion of acceleration to digital that people talk about. So that'd be a big area I'd be focusing on. The other thing I'd say is, you know, we've been speaking to VCs recently, including Lord Mentum and from us a few others around investment thesis going forward. And, and I, I really hang on Martin's words that the VC community is confident in the long-term viability of fintech. It must be because we've got crusty old financial services sitting to one side that needs renovation quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good area, but we need to focus on things that are different. So if people are looking at this trade mission saying, I'm coming to the UK with an invoice finance product, don't bother, don't come. We've got enough of those already. Need to look at points of difference. and We mm -hmm. need to be able to mature the market somewhat so the areas I think that are wide open for anyone coming to the UK, and by the way, I'm a Kiwi, I'm an immigrant, so I've found a place over here myself. Um, I'd be focused on these areas. One would be capital markets. A lot of focus on retail banking, retail consumer, capital markets, place to go. Later life products. No one is wor worrying about people after 60. We need a crusty old Monzo here. Um, we need things like that that are actually going to help serve that market. They've got the wealth. The only service that I've seen that's really starting to come into its own is Standard Chartered Ventures Autumn product, which is a later life product for people to enjoy themselves. So that'd be one. Um, areas of adjacency, um, property, health, health obviously right now. Um, these are really big areas I think we need to solve collectively. And if you've got fintech capabilities in the area, um, I think that's a good one. Needs identification rather than product. We still have a very product focused financial services industry. And we need firms like Fleurly or others that actually say, here are the financial lifestyle needs of customers. Predict them, then pull in the product behind it. We don't have enough of that in the UK. And then final one, and I work with Google and Microsoft. And strangely enough, they've got acceleration plans for, for cloud right now. In fact, we're on a cloud device right now through this pane of glass. So they're really, really pushing hard to take advantage of this dislocation of markets to make the world cloud. Mm -hmm. I would say anyone who's coming to the UK who's got really good capabilities around ethics, security, confidentiality of data, um, really good AI ML capabilities that they can put into use cases, um, please come over because we just don't have enough of that right now. We've got a lot of digital legacy financial services, but we don't have the next gen. And to me, those are the big opportunities that I'd be sort of flagging up that people should you know, come into London, um, enjoy the community that's here. You've got great VCs. We've got an awesome a um, bunch of people that can support. Hmm. So hopefully that's helpful. It's a dark world, but there's opportunity. Immensely, immensely insightful there. Uh, essentially, if there is uh, no demand, um, then don't try and, and come over it and, and basically feel what there is, right? And I think it's important to be reminded. Um, just in terms of getting some practical advice, Dan uh, Fiheni, I'm really struggling with surname today, Fiheni, I think, um, has asked on the Q&A, and maybe Martin, I can come to you here. Uh, he's asked, given the COVID shock, how does the fintech balance growth, and that might include international expansion and customer acquisition, along with cash flow and runway? Uh, obviously a, a very pertinent question there. Martin, in terms of advice there, balancing growth, customer acquisition and cash flow, what have you been telling your um, telling your portfolio? Is it basically time to turn the tap off or, or turn the tap on in terms of... So, I mean, I, 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 I referred um, to what uh, Caroline said said earlier about, uh, uh, you know, the, the financing choices uh, being being around access to finance as opposed to, to, to performance. I think, uh, you know, there, there is definitely uh, an element of requiring a, a shift of focus through these kind of periods. I mean, a lot of the work we've done with our portfolio has been on extending runway and ensuring liquidity in, in, in our businesses, the ones that, uh, that, 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 that needed that. 
Um, and I think, you know, some of the experience we've had as well is that there are significant opportunities for, for efficiencies, uh, or at least through this period there have been, where you peel back some of the, uh, in, a, in a high growth business, uh, you wouldn't normally uh, necessarily test the elasticity of the marketing spend, for example. And actually, having been having been forced to forced to look at that or examine that more closely through this period, you 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 understand that growth is achievable without applying so, you know applying so so, so much uh, so, so much capital to that area. Part of that is because perhaps through the COVID period, there's been a reduction in noise and online marketing, uh, but there are certainly efficiencies available around the business if you look if you look for them and see and seek for those efficiencies. So, uh, I think this period has given. Um, some, some of our portfolio co uh, companies the opportunity to examine uh, elasticities of spend around some, some, some of the bigger areas and, and that, that is an opportunity for extended runway. I mean in general, in general um, the, the businesses that are backed by venture capital are those that can scale rapidly and don't require significant build of cost in advance of revenue uh, escalation, I think some of the some of the some of the areas of fintech that we have struggled with, in particular in short tech end to end in short tech, whether that be on an MGA basis or you know full stack reinsured basis, that do require you to spend significantly ahead of the curve is, is, is ex exactly the reasons we haven't invested. So um, you know a piece of general advice uh, to portfolio companies would be to to ensure that they do. <laughs> I mean I, I guess I'm just repeating repeating the question, but ensure that you do look at the way that you build your cost base uh, and, and ensure that that cost is is, is somewhat in step uh, with the development of your revenues and doesn't get too far ahead. So effectively as efficient as you can be. Um remind yourself of, of that. Um, in terms of, you know, the time that we're in at the moment, some people might say, you know, do we need fintechs when things are slow? Uh, people are prioritizing paying the bills and, and perhaps not so much uh, fancy fancy cards, et cetera, on the B2C side. Um, Caroline, what do you think about that in terms of, you know, are we, are we preparing for a world, uh, you know, a future world or, or is now a time when, you know, we should be focusing on these things? I mean, I think what's interesting is undoubtedly consumer behavior is going to be impacted for the long term. You know, it's, they say it takes 21 days to form a habit and we've all been sitting here for about 21 weeks, it feels like. And I think uh, so our habits are very much newly changed and like to be ingrained. And I think some of the movement around um, away from cash uh, towards ease, towards convenience, towards at home or localized um, purchase and spend and consumption behavior. I think some of these things are going to stick around for a long time and so i think and i think a lot of fintechs are you know although they have shiny cards and uh, shiny propositions um they have been successful often because they've been able to do provide something with a much lower friction uh, mm -hmm. a much more straightforward way and often at much lower cost than incumbents and i think actually those are characteristics that consumers will continue to value and if anything i think it's, it's seen a shift of perhaps segments of the market towards digitization and towards um, more technology oriented trends much faster than it otherwise would have been i've got my parents you know uh, doing zoom and uh, e-commerce you know something that uh, would have been almost unthinkable <laughs> six months ago and so and i think some of those are now likely to stick it's a short yeah. hop there from then moving to a, um, a completely branch free bank um, yeah. but I, I think I think that will shift kind of mindset um, for the long term. So actually, I think it will favour fintechs in the in the long run. Um, yeah. Although the general reliance on payments um, as a revenue source is going to cause some a lot of pain in the short term, and we and credit both of which. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I think there may be a lag there in terms of consumers yeah. picking up uh, and using the fintechs available and launching indeed. Um, and, and I think digital banks are seeing a slowdown at the moment. So I think it is a good a good thing to remember that you know times are changing, but we might see a delay there. Um, I wanted to kind of differentiate between some of the portfolio companies that Martin might be seeing and you, Caroline. You know, you're already existing. You're already up and ready. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot, of, a lot of the people watching today will be launching, and they'll be at the very beginning of their race. Um, a founder that I spoke to in April, so quite quite the start of the lockdown, 
and he said to me quote it's hard to get a market shut down and he, they hadn't launched yet this fintech um and they basically didn't have that foothold that, that you and martin might have um in your in your areas um so so helen can i come to you there does that speak true to what you're seeing that the market has shut down so to speak and that if you you know you might have people in your network who are getting ready to launch or are at that very early stage of the race how has the experience been for them or, or can you speak to, you know, just in terms of the readiness of the market? Um, I, I think that the open banking market and open finance market has, has got a, a great deal to, to contend with. I think that, um, that the funding for a, a, a startup is, is um, you know, is, is tough right now. Um, and I do know that a lot of people are, have pressed hold, um, you know, for, for example. Um, but I, what I am seeing... Um, is, is, is that, um, th that they are bringing um, the scale-ups are actually achieving, as I was saying before, uh, Series A and Series A plus um, funding. So to the point that Martin uh, was made it right at the top of this uh, panel, is that if, if the funding was in flight, that is being closed. But there have been really um, fabulous entrepreneurs that have actually gone out and started new Series A rounds and closed them during COVID. And that has to be commended. Um, but I, I would also say that, you know, going to what Caroline was saying, that, that we are seeing a huge amount of innovation in fintech, and particularly in the open banking sector. We all remember Captain Tom, okay? And he was, you know, he all inspired us during those very dark COVID days. 30 million of payments, if we want to talk about a use case here, was co uh, collected through open banking payments. So we believe that open banking payments should be ubiquitous. And, 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 and that is, is a change we're all now getting used to living in a cashless society. Caroline's absolutely right. It does take 21 days to change a habit. And we've now stopped to, to a greater extent using cash. And, you know, if, if you have a look at some of the use cases around open banking and, and the payments, and if you also have a look at people like uh, Freddie, Freddie from uh, Credit Kudos, he's closed his Series A uh, funding during COVID. They are doing a huge amount um, in terms of financial inclusion and, and driving and supporting lending in, in that area. Um, so pe people are sort of pivoting and to, to use that sort of cliche word now that we all sort of have in our in lexicon and, and changing to that end. So what we're seeing is, is how entrepreneurs and, and particularly founders within our community have, have galvanized their teams and, and are really, really re responding to it. That's not, not taken away from the fact that we've got as an industry quite a few issues. You know, we've got, you know, the, 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 the uh, insolvency mess of, of Wirecard looming and the regulatory changes that need to be required there. We've obviously got SCA, Secure mm -hmm. Customer Authentication, and I said before Brexit. But there's, there is a huge amount of, of good going along, particularly with, with open banking and, and, and the payment side. Yeah, it's a credit card is one of the examples of a company that closed pretty much at the beginning of lockdown. So it had that kind of um, that pipeline. Um, but yeah, so, so Martin, can I just get your thoughts there on about the, the readiness of the market and, and what that founder said about hard to get a foothold in, you know, in terms, in terms of timing. Um, if someone were thinking about coming over and launching a fintech product, is now is now the time? Yeah, I mean, I, I just pick up on some of the points that some of the other panelists have said there. So in terms of habit forming um, uh, that Caroline uh, uh, talked about, if you look at some of the ONS data, the UK pre-COVID was already uh, highest uh, penetration of retail online sales pretty much globally, at about 20%, one in five pounds. If you look at it post-COVID, it's now one in three pounds, it's at 33%. And you know, that is a radical shift. It took seven years for the UK to get from 10% to 20%. It's taken uh, six months uh, to get from 10, from 20 to, to, to 33. And obviously, you know, behind that is, is, is all the implications on moving away from cash um, uh, that, that Helen, Helen was talking about. And I think, you know, I saw another chart that suggested ATM usage was down 40%. So, I mean, there have been massive changes in behavior and those kind of, these kind of disruptions in consumer behavior drive uh, both uh, demand for and the availability of entrepreneurial talent. So one of the, one of the you know, people are released from larger organizations, for example, when they're entrenched, which gives a stock of entrepreneurial availability. And these kind of disruptions drive opportunities. So I think there is both a availability of both opportunity 
and uh, potentially of supply. And that's you know one one of the characteristics of the UK mar market. FinTech. Everybody looks at FinTech. Says, look, you drive sixty percent of uh, of European investment in in, in VC. It was about five billion, I think, last year uh, invested in, in in the UK, if I remember off the top of my head. Um, and uh, you know, it must be the it must be the market uh, for, for for us to enter. And, and of course, you know, there's availability of talent. There's there's the the, the uh, incumbent network here uh, that, that's resident uh, in London in terms of you know financial services there's access to the world there's there's free and available capital markets I mean it, you know it's, it's a great place to be as, as I you know as I saw, saw the Lord, Lord Mayor talking about when we we entered into this call but you know on the other the other side of that it is actually one of the most competitive markets in the world uh, you know we have significant numbers of companies here uh, we need to recognize that uh, you know that as a consequence the UK market is one of the most competitive in the world for fintech products yeah. uh, and so i you know reflect on what uh, you know anton was saying earlier as well to, to make sure that you know if you are entering the uk market you do have something that's uh, fundamentally uh, innovative uh, and fundamentally differentiated you know i think fintech as a sector is generally about 10 years behind generalized technology and generalized vc investments uh, you know, the, the, the wave of VC in Europe started in the noughties in, 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 in ad tech and retail and e-commerce and marketplaces. Uh, and only really in the last five or 10 years has shifted to fintech where sort of regulatory capital and other barriers prevented that uh, first off. Yes. Um, there is a nascent system. massive opportunity here, but it's well competing. Absolutely. So if you can get a flight and you do have the right uh, the demand gap to fill, then, then now is, is a fine time in short. Yeah. Um, Anton, I want to come to you. We have a question from the audience, just in terms of what Caroline mentioned about change in habits uh, and, you know, the, the adoption of new technologies, etc. One person's asked, uh, do we think that technology will play a role in uh, furthering the discussions around a four day week, which supports more productivity? Uh, well, I'll tell you what, if we get a four day week, I'm, I'm up for it because I'm just working <laughs> double time at the moment for oh, like everyone that's <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, probably. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, HSBC have trialed in one of their large business units yeah. a four-day working week. Yeah. The reason they've done it is not for kind of um, employee experience uh, or, or well-being. It's actually for productivity. Mm -hmm. And and they felt that they've kind of got to the end degree of bureaucracy and can't get any further. So, um, yeah, I think um, that may may have a, a part to play. And certainly some of the technology providers out there would would say that they can do that, namely Microsoft, I'm sure, with their office suite and Teams and all that stuff. Mm. Um, so it'd be interesting times to, 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 to go ahead. If you just go on to, I suppose, the impact of virtual working, if I just riff on that a little bit, yeah. interesting stats coming out recently around the fact that you don't need to be an old street anymore to be a fintech. Yeah. Um, and I think 60% of uh, staff that work for fintech in London saying actually they'd be quite happy not to live in London anymore and work more remotely to provide services to that fintech firm. And again, I think around Caroline or think around other firms out there that have already been actively moving to Newcastle, Leeds, Wales, or whatever it might be, mm. better quality of life, lower cost base, um, more productivity, less commute, happy days for everyone. Um, so I think that will be something that we see more of in the future. And again, if you're coming from Australia or New Zealand or somewhere like that to England, then maybe think about that as well. Um, the downside is you're not close to investors, so, but the good side is you can get to Martin quite quickly through a device like this. Um, so that's one thing. I was going to say, you can, you can be in Old Street. We are, I'm sitting in Old Street right now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, see, so you're a trendy fintech person, Martin. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so maybe that's something to think about. Some trade-offs there to, to decide. But um, another good thing about the UK is we have so many global hubs. Whether it's Manchester or Edinburgh or to a lesser degree Birmingham, you know, mm -hmm. we can get to the world quite easily from from the UK. And and equally you can get here from the world quite easily as well. So I'd be encouraging people to think about that. Lower cost of entry, yeah. lower cost of, you know, kit to set up, and um, think around the ecosystem and then maybe speak to some founders or VC houses before, before you arrive about that that strategy. 
Yeah, but we'll, we'll have a discussion um, in the next session about, you know, the world outside London and some of the different hubs in the UK. Um, we've spoken, I actually speak a lot to founders, a lot about investors. Uh, Caroline, I wanted to get the perspective of employees um, from your discussions, you know, maybe they're fans of the four day working week. Um, but what's been the experience, do you think, for, for your staff? And is there anything that you've done as a founder to try and, you know, change the conditions that they might be adapting to now, uh, you know, maybe some long-standing changes um, to the way that you work with your employees because again you know launching uh, having to motivate staff keep morale up at this this time you know, that's one of the big challenges here yeah I mean I think it, it will transform the way businesses have relationships with their team but I don't think it's an easy kind of one-size-fits-all I mean I think what's really shown is that the impact of lockdown the impact of working on home working from home has had very different effects for the team. Um, some people are delighted with it. They get to work from home all the time and they've taken the opportunity and they say they want to go fully remote. But I would say a vast majority um, want some office um, contact again, either for social reasons um, or because for collaboration or because actually their home environment isn't very suited to working. Uh, there's a reason why it's a home and not an office. And so, um, and I think, you know, something like a four day week discussion um, you know, I think that's it might appeal to a, a segment, but many people have childcare responsibilities. Many people have school and education responsibilities, uh, and you know that those schools, education, university settings are not talking about that. So, I, I do think what what my hope is really is that it leads to a much more diverse and inclusive workforce, um, yeah. which allows people more flexibility to be more of themselves, whether they're at home or at work. And I think people will make better decisions, um, you know, for themselves and employers hopefully make better decisions as well. So from our perspective, you know, we'll be definitely offering an office space. But we definitely won't be mandating anyone to be in it five days a week. And if you want to be in it zero days a week, um, we probably look to accommodate that too. So um, I think it's going to be a much more um, personalised approach by individual member taking into account their needs and circumstances um, rather than trying to have a sort of one-size-fits-all generalised policy and I hope that's going to be the case in that I think there have been many parts of the workforce that have been less able to work more flexibly because they've got childcare responsibilities or perhaps disabled or perhaps um, move in a different part of the country geographically with less access. I think it's going to throw up a lot of questions as to how we can build a, a better and more diverse workforce in the future um yeah no absolutely and um, we have about 10 minutes left um i just wanted to dig down a little bit more into what anton raised about some of the specific subsectors and subgenres of fintech that are best positioned here um i'll come to helen first in terms of you know anton mentioned capital markets uh you know payments broadly uh, I assume you'll say open banking, but perhaps you could just give us some context on on why that you know this is a good time for for that subgenre, if indeed it is, and maybe you can go beyond that and tell us a few others that you think are in a good position here. Thank you. Um, I, I'm I'm the co-founder of a, a, an open banking and open finance community, so you bang on. I'm going to say that it's open banking. Um, I, I think it's all about use cases and we've made a, a big commitment to listen to the feedback that we've got always to, to reference use cases. So if, if I can, can follow the, the brief that our community have, have given us, you know, we talked about uh, Captain Tom and, and those 30 million of payments that were made through open banking. Now, you, you don't need to know um, how that payment is made, you know, but I believe that open banking payments should be ubiquitous. And, and it, it's, it's a utility. I mean, the, the general public doesn't really need to know that open banking is secure um, and it's a way of you know, sharing data to a third party. They just need to know that it works and it works fast and it, and, and it works securely. Um, so, so payments um, is, 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 is a big, big growth sector within open banking. But mm -hmm. then if you have a look at what the, the FCA have done, we had the, the consultation document um, in terms of uh, looking at open finance and that is where the next uh, phase of, of, of the open banking into open finance and then into open life will go. So you've got people like um, Sam Seaton, uh, chief exec of, of Money Hub and the, and, and the great stuff that they're doing around wealth and around pensions and nudging people into making different habits, going back to Caroline's great point about changing back, um, by behaviour habits and then if you look at some of the other apps that are on the market, Snoop is, is a great one. Yeah. Um, I, I spoke to that team, you know, pre-launch, 
and that, that's one, one to follow. Um, they they um, will, will, will take all of the, the drudge away from um, you changing um, utility bill suppliers, etc. So the, there is a huge amount of, 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 of change happening, but being driven by, um, you know, we, we've now grown up in open banking, um, to be fair. We've gone through a, a lot of change and last year we got sort of bogged down in some of the regulations, but now the, the, the pandemic has really, really driven us all focusing on, on those user cases. Um, so I, I, there's obviously all the, the alternative lending space as well is, is growing. So those would be my, my three would be um, payments that will drive the, the growth trajectory, wealth and, and, and pensions, and then the alternative lending space. And I think that's really one to, to watch. There's a whole yeah. dy dy dynamic sector um, happening there. I'm just thinking out loud here. I wonder if um, companies coming from overseas will be able to play in the open banking space because obviously the UK has been one of the first to do that. I understand that Hong Kong actually is following quite closely, but I just wonder if fintech startups are even catered, you know, overseas can can play in that space if they haven't had the regulation. But well, that's for another day, I think. But yeah, an interesting an interesting topic of conversation to be had. And um, Martin, just to, to to reverse the question, if we've talked about what what might be, uh, you know, a particularly attractive space right now in fintech. What is out of vogue? What are the fintechs coming to you that you're just saying, it's just not a good time for you? Um, I prefer to <laughs> focus on the positive part of that. I mean, I, yeah. I, I think, you know, from us personally, um, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not specifically seeking uh, more lending uh, exposure. Um, that, that may be a, a sort of I guess uh, an assessment of where of where we are as much as uh, as much as the state of, of the market. I mean, if if I if I think for, from a macro perspective, and I mentioned earlier early on that um, you know if you look at um, fintech, it, it is generally lagged behind sort of general tech uh, uptake. Um, the first wave of innovation in uh, in the fintech for the low hanging fruit was all consumer facing, you know, new business uh, models such as P2P lending, better customer interfaces, driving better experiences like the neobanks. And the, the idea was there, was like, collect digital natives and the first movers and build, uh, you know, sustainable future businesses on, on, the, on the back of that. And, and if you look sort of down into, into one layer, the middle and back ends are only just starting uh, really to, 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 to innovate. You know, deeper innovation comes from the use of big data uh, and, and AI, and they pioneer kind of more frictionless consumer experiences at the front end and expand that first mover and digital natives piece to, to, to a, mass, uh, a mass audience, and then that adoption drives further trust. So I think, and delivers, de delivering seamless consumer experience. So if I, if I think from a macro perspective, we're definitely thinking uh, that you know, and you mentioned earlier that the portfolio was, you know, re relatively well exposed on B2C front, the mm. more opportunities are going to come through on that B2B front. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, you know, InsureTech is a good, is a good example of that. So we've seen mm. lots of attempted innovation at the, front, at the front end, which is really not, it, only in very selective cases shifted, shifted the needle. When in fact, you've got enormous pools of existing liquidity with massive structural problems uh, internally on the, on the platforms, large, large elements of manual uh, operations, large inefficiencies and huge areas of cost with massive uh, opportunity to disrupt that. And I think, you know, we're seeing an increasing number of players coming through on a value chain perspective, insurance as a service and the yeah. facilitation around that. Uh, and then to pick up on, on what Helen was saying around the lending or at least financing space, certainly associated technologies around debt recovery, life cycle management and accounting. Those are two of the, the really big areas. And then if I think of the third area, which actually kind of is more uh, uh, pointing at, at still back at B2C, but, you know, I kind of forced through with, the, uh, you know, with, with the disruption that we've seen, we get an increased, uh, an increased saving rate uh, currently forced and precautionary basis. Uh, we're seeing, we're seeing more on the wealth and, um, uh, and, and, and the wealth management space ex expanding into that mass audience. And there, there has to be opportunities there because, you know, significantly, if you look at the ONS data, savings rate are particularly skewed at the moment to higher income brackets and, you know, facilitating lower income brackets to saving. So yeah. those, are, those are some of the themes that I think are, that, that, that we're thinking about. 
interested in, particularly at the in, in, in sure tech space, which I think is uh, ready to have its moment. We have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to finish with Anton. Um, if you could just share your, your kind of main piece of advice for, you know, high growth fintechs coming over, what's the one trap, for example, that they should be looking to avoid uh, in terms of coming to the UK specifically, either a trap or a single piece of advice that you might have to finish off with? Well, that's a tough one. Um, don't oversell yourself. Um, it's amazing how many fintech founders I meet who've come in inbound. They've, they've solved world hunger in Australia or New Zealand or whatever, or Fiji, um, arriving into to England. And, and yeah, you know, market is mature. Um, so I think coming in with um, your ears wide open, um, really trying to get around the market as much as possible and meet your end customers, whether that is consumers, SMEs, institutional clients, whatever it might be, would be a good thing, I think. Um, that would be the one. Um, and I think, again, the ecosystem here, whether it's Innovate Finance, it was mentioned earlier on, whether it's Open Banking Excellence, whether it is VC Communities, City of London, there's a lot of people here who've got bits and pieces of the pie that they're very, very happy to share. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd, I'd come in and do some proper due diligence first. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, be ready to course correct for the UK market. Brilliant. Thank you so much to all four of you and um, thank you for joining and have a great day.